everybody. So hi, I'm Kathy Harvard, and I'm one of the volunteer organizers for the Upper Valley Walk to End Alzheimer's, and that's coming up, yep, Saturday, um, October 2nd, first Saturday of the month, just a few short weeks away. And so we particularly appreciate you guys being with us here today, and we thank Osher for hosting this important event as part of what is really a community-wide effort during the weeks prior to the walk to raise awareness about Alzheimer's and of course to raise some enthusiasm about the walk itself. So thank you all for being here and thanks for sharing this. Let me just begin for just a second to talk about the Upper Valley Walk to End Alzheimer's. It's actually one of 600 walks just like this all around the country and it always goes on this time of year. This is our fifth here in the Upper Valley. And what it is, is the world's largest fundraiser and awareness raiser for Alzheimer's care, support, and research. So it, 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 to us, it's a very important thing. And all across the nation, folks of all, nation, of all ages, all abilities, dogs, children, old folks, young folks, we all come together to be part of the fight to end these um, really difficult diseases. And we hope that you'll consider joining us too. There's a link, of course, in the chat window that give you all the details, but just to just give you a couple, we hope that you'd be able to join us if you can, if you're comfortable, on October 2nd, around 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning in front of Hanover High School for a very short walk around the Hanover Green. But, you know, we realize not everybody is going to be comfortable coming out to walk in that area, even though I'll tell you in just a moment, we'll be walking quite safely. So if you would choose to have your own walk, in your own community with your own team of friends and family, please, by all means, feel comfortable doing that. Um, and you'll be able to join us as well because there's a mobile app that can help you be part of it. But no matter where you are and how you participate, please know that from our point of view, that your health and safety is really the top priority. And so we'll have safety protocols going on during our own larger walk. Um, which includes social distancing, contact reg contactless registration, lots of hand sanitizing stations, and of course, lots of masks. And we'll be following the CDC guidance as well as the town of Hanover's um, suggestions and guidance on this the day of the event. So please know whatever, we will be doing this safely, but whatever you decide to do, please join us. And please know that all the funds that are raised from this and all the, the awareness that is raised from this event actually goes to support the Alzheimer's Association to support 24-7 care and um, um, helpline and support programs, education programs, and ultimately helping us with prevention, uh, treatment, and management, and maybe even one day a cure. And the research that you're going to hear more about so we know that Alzheimer's, of course, is a growing phenomena that affects all of us. Most all of us know somebody have been affected directly, but even if you haven't, you are aware, I'm sure, of its impact on our, um, on our community, on our nation. Already this year, we expect it's gonna cost our nation about $355 billion this year. And that would reach more than a trillion dollars each year by 2050, if we are not successful in our efforts with research to find a way to stop these diseases. And that of course is what Liz is going to be talking about. So I'm very pleased and thank Liz McCarthy, who is the health systems director for the Alzheimer's Association of New England region for joining us today. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself, but I will just simply say that she works every day with health systems throughout New England to drive detection, diagnosis, and management of Alzheimer's and all of dementias, because that's what we're talking about. And she's on the front line every day of many of these research efforts that now give us really reason for hope that there will be a way to manage these dreaded diseases. So with that, I'll turn it over and say thank you very much for being with us, Liz, and thank you very much to all of you for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for that great introduction, Kathy, and for um, your words about the Upper Valley Walk. I personally am very excited this year. I was determined to do at least one walk in each of our six New England states, and I will be in the Upper Valley, um, hopefully crossing from New Hampshire into Vermont so that I can get all six states, but I'll, I'll be there um, in person. So I'm very excited about it. 
Also, um, with me today is my colleague and wing woman, Melissa Grenier, who has um, graciously offered to monitor the chat for questions. So if you have questions, just feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, we should have plenty of time after um, the slides are done to answer your questions. So um, without any further ado, I'll um, get going here. Okay, so the Alzheimer's Association is the largest worldwide voluntary health organization dedicated to Alzheimer's care and research. And our mission is to lead the way for Alzheimer's and all other forms of dementia, accelerating global research, uh, increasing early detection and maximizing quality care. Our time today will be spent talking about the landscape of Alzheimer's and uh, dementia. We'll talk about some highlights in early detection and diagnosis, and then really get into some of the latest advances in clinical trials, treatment, and lifestyle interventions. And we'll also talk about ways for you to get involved, some of which include things, of course, like attending our Walk to End Alzheimer's, but some of which are as easy as um, having an app on your phone. So. Kathy mentioned a little bit um, of the information included on this particular slide. Every year in the April timeframe, the Alzheimer's Association publishes our, our facts and figures. So for 2021, we were really focusing on um, discrimination and barriers to access and barriers to diagnosis and care. But you can see right at the top there in 2021, this, this year, we will spend in the United States $355 billion on the care of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. And by 2050, also as Kathy said, these costs will rise to over a trillion dollars a year. And so that has, if, if we don't do anything now, um, we are really putting our entire healthcare system at risk. Uh, we would not be able, that's, that's larger than our GDP. There's no way we'd be able to sustain that. There are currently more than 6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease, and one in three seniors will die with Alzheimer's or another dementia. Um, Alzheimer's deaths have increased 16% during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in fact, our um, international conference that took place in July, several researchers presented on looking for the link between the, the a virus that causes, or excuse me, yeah, the virus that actually causes COVID-19, which is the disease, um, and its effect on, on your neurology and your brain cells. They're doing a lot of looking into that. Additionally, this year, we spent time, as I had said, looking at discrimination. And discrimination is a barrier to Alzheimer's and dementia care. And these particular populations reported discrimination when seeking health care. 50% of Blacks, 42% of Native Americans, 34% of Asian Americans, and 33% of Hispanic Americans reported discrimination when seeking care for Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And that's even more important because gender, racial, and ethnic disparities in, in Alzheimer's are very prevalent in, in our trials. And when you think about it, almost two thirds of Americans with um, Alzheimer's disease are women. And initially, it's, it's easy to kind of write that off and say, well, hey, women live longer than men. So, of course, they're um, more likely uh, to have the disease. But it can't just be that. So there's a lot of research right now into what that, you know, chromosomally, what does the XX um, chromosome, why does that make it more likely and increases the incidence um, of Alzheimer's in women versus men? Older Black and Hispanic uh, Americans are dispor disproportionately more likely than older whites to have the disease. Um, Black Americans are about twice as likely and Hispanics about one and a half times as likely. And even hitting home uh, along with that is that ethno-racial groups have been historically underrepresented. Um, so if we are, really want to address why are more Blacks and Hispanics getting this disease, we need to incorporate them in more of our clinical trials. 
it's important to remember that dementia, the word dementia is, is, is a syndrome and it's describing a group of symptoms that are associated with cognitive impairment. Um, these symptoms can include cognitive changes, behavioral changes, psychological symptoms, but they're all due to actual biological changes that occur in the brain. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. About, about two thirds of all dementias are Alzheimer's. Keeping in mind that a mixed dementia is also a very uh, prevalent diagnosis um, and a mixed dementia, Alzheimer's disease with some other form make up about half of all of the um, of forms of dementia. Vascular dementia represents uh, about 10 to 40%. Dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal lobe dementia, all of those are um, forms of dementia, um, and uh, that and they are the ones that are listed here are not reversible. Cognitive impairment occurs on a continuum, <clears throat> and all of this over here on the left, these kind of green arrows, are when impairment does not interfere with the activities of daily living. By the time, though, you get to mild cognitive impairment, that's a known risk factor for dementia. So not everyone who um, experiences mild cognitive impairment will go on to develop dementia. But when you prevent new cases of mild cognitive impairment, you're presenting new cases, preventing new cases of dementia. And we'll talk more about that as, as we get into this a little bit further. So I just want to talk briefly about the biology of the disease. Um, these are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. There are two uh, naturally occurring proteins in your body. One is called beta amyloid, and the other is called hyperphosphorylated tau. And um, beta amyloid and tau is, is what we'll call them um, moving forward. So on the outside of the brain cell, which is called a neuron, um, on the outside of the brain cell, the beta amyloid will um, start appearing, more of it than should be normal will start appearing, and it actually forms clumps, right? It's a sticky protein, so they clump together. So if you're, if my two fingers here are represent two neurons, and this in between them is the synapse, how they get information from one to the next, the beta amyloid clumps in between and prevents the signal from going across from one to the next. What's happening inside the, the neuron, if my finger again could be a neuron, is that these um, deposits of the tau protein actually break down the scaffolding that keeps that cell intact. So it, it, it's like the bone structure, right, of your body um, or, or the scaffolding. It just um, begins to collapse and tangles up on itself. So um, those two things lead to the death of the, of the nerve cells. And over here on the right side of the screen, you can see um, a segmented brain. The left side is representing a healthy brain and the right side is representing a, a um, diseased brain. And that normal, healthy um, human brain weighs um, right around five pounds. Um, the brain with Alzheimer's disease will, will weigh around one pound. So that it, it, it's truly your cells are dying, right? Um, uh, and that's causing the disease. I, I like to put them all up at once so that there's no guessing later. So I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, but what can impact your risk is something that's super important when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. And there are things that we can't change, like our age, as much as I would like to, I cannot go back to being 35. Um, genetics, race, ethnicity, those, those are the things we can't change. But what affects our overall risk, as you can see, there are modifiable risk factors here on the right. And those include things like envi environmental and lifestyle factors, cardiovascular health, physical activity, diet, sleep, social and cognitive engagement, education, and traumatic brain injury. So you can ask, I have, I have two sons, uh, they're 17 and 14, and they will tell you that none of their friends wear bike helmets and that my making them wear a bike helmet is probably the worst thing that I could ever possibly do to them. But I am trying to prevent any kind of traumatic brain injury so that they've got 
everything going for them moving forward um, in their lives. So, so things like that, things like um, getting a good night's sleep, seven to nine hours a night seems to be the sweet spot for um, cognitive brain health. Staying physically active, eating a, a healthy diet, um, taking care of your cardiovascular health, all of these things can decrease your risk from Alzheimer's disease. So we'll talk a little bit about available therapies and um, I'll point out this handsome gentleman on the far left um, in the black and white photo. That's a picture of Alois Alzheimer. Dr. Alzheimer um, in 1906 was the first person to look at the brain of someone who had died from this, this collection of symptoms known as dementia and um, noted the plaques and tangles that we now know are beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles, and he was the first person to describe them. So it took 90 years before there was a drug at all um, to, to help people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And that drug in 1996 was denepazil, which most people will know as Aricept. Um, so it's been around since 1996. Uh, denepazil and rivastigmine, galantamine, amantine, and um, then Mamantine combined with denepazil, known as Namzarek, all of those are cholinesterase um, inhibitors. And um, remember what I said about the, the two neurons talking to each other? So if you have fewer neurons that can do that, what those drugs do is push more signal across the neurons that are still healthy. Okay. Um, so in that way, you can address some of the symptoms um, by not by having fewer neurons, making the ones that are still there work a little more efficiently. That's what they do, but they don't do anything as far as altering the course of the disease or, or changing the course of the disease. So that's where we got to um, Aduhelm or Aducanumab. Um, Aduhelm is a drug that's gotten a lot of press recently. Um, it was approved in um, June of this year, June 6th, and it is the first disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And it works on that beta amyloid um, that I was talking about that, um, uh, that forms those plaques in between the brain cells. So it works on decreasing the amount of beta amyloid in the brain. Um, and hopefully then we'll, we'll improve cognition. Behind the various research efforts fueled by the Alzheimer's Association, advancements are always happening. And I just wanna point out that the Alzheimer's Association has been involved with every major um, research uh, finding that's, that's occurred over the, the past uh, several decades. At any given moment, there's research and learning and discoveries. And we are the largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's and dementia research in the world. And that's something I'm really proud of. And I share it when I'm doing my own fundraising. You know, every year I have my um, little Facebook page to raise money for the Walk to End Alzheimer's. And I know that my friends and my family must get really tired. Here comes Liz asking for a check again. Um, but I, I'm always proud to say we have $250 million currently active in over 730 projects in 39 countries spanning six continents. So that's really quite remarkable and it makes me really proud to work for this, for this association. We also advocate, and Kathy Harvard again can tell you about this, one of our super advocates. We've been able to get the federal government to increase their um, response to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And back in you know um, 10 years ago in 2011, um, it, was it was only 448 million, which uh, in, in federal dollar terms is, is really nothing. Um, and we've gotten them now, uh, you know, this is a bipartisan um, disease when a, uh, and a bipartisan issue, one of the very few that's out there. Um, but uh, we have, uh, we anticipate that we'll be getting $3.4 billion approved in um, 2022. And that's uh, the proposal from the House Appropriations Committee. 
this is a super exciting time in research. And I'll just tell you a little bit about what's going on. Biomarkers are really changing the game um, and are accelerating the speed of research. So we started out over here on the left, uh, uh, the first biomarker really that we had for Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is something that would tell you you had the disease other than a symptom, right? So a doctor um, named, I um, can't remember his first name, but it's Dr. Funk from the University of Pittsburgh. He discovered a radioisotope that would bind to um, the beta amyloid in the brain. So that we know that beta amyloid is in the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease. So now if we can see it on a PET scan image, right, um, we'll, we're able to tell if the person has Alzheimer's disease, if they don't, how advanced it is, what parts of the brain is it affecting, all those different things. So, so you can see the um, radioisotope lights up red in the presence of beta amyloid. So this is a pretty advanced case of Alzheimer's disease here. We're also looking though at biofluid analysis. In biofluid, uh, we can now detect beta amyloid in cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and hopefully soon we're going to be able to look at blood biomarkers. So these are, um, uh, you know, when you go to get your cholesterol checked or your hemoglobin checked or your hematocrit, your platelet level, whatever in your blood, we're hoping that in a few years, they'll also be able to see your synuclein level or your TDP 43 level. Um, and it, is that increasing and does it mean that you should um, go for further uh, testing and counseling? And then emerging biomarkers include things like neurofilament light. And this is a picture of an eye, someone's eye. Um, so they're looking at a way to look into your eye and look at the uptake of neurofilament light and be able again to assess whether um, you need to go for further testing. Um, and of course, this is um, your good old double helix, uh, your DNA, and looking at um, emerging markers from your DNA. We really want to modernize the diagnosis. And instead of waiting until someone is symptomatic and perhaps severely symptomatic, what, what we want to do is get to that point 20 years or more before symptoms begin to appear so that we can do things about our diet and exercise and other chronic conditions um, to really put off um, the potential of getting Alzheimer's disease and perhaps even keep it in that mild cognitive impairment stage where you're still um, completely functional. Okay. Um, sometimes I, I know, especially recently with aducanumab, aduhelm, um, that, that uh, the drug that was the first in its class um, and the first uh, disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's disease, it's easy to get hung up on that one thing. But as of April of this year, there were 129 drugs and devices in phase one um, uh, uh, studies, 191 in phase two and 62 that were in phase three studies. So there's really a lot out there. Um, you know, if you're looking at your bullseye and hitting the target, we, we have a lot of good news out there. There's always a need for participants. Um, trial match is something that you can do. ALZ.org slash trial match. So I, uh, the, the Alzheimer's Association um, flinches every time I say this, but I describe trial match as sort of a dating service for um, connecting you with a clinical trial that would be of interest to you. Um, signing up for trial match does not uh, put you in any kind of a clinical trial. Um, it just lets you know which ones you might be eligible for ones that are in your area or are available to do virtually. Um, and just, try, you know, if you're interested, then you take the next step and, and connect with the um, lab and they can tell you more. So treatments being tested may benefit the clinical symptoms or change the disease progression. So over here under cognition, there are things that might change memory, learning, thinking, and planning. But for anyone who's ever been a caregiver for someone with dementia and 
I lost my mom to frontotemporal lobe dementia, and we lost my father-in-law to Alzheimer's disease. It's really those behavioral, behavioral and psychological symptoms that are the hardest for fa on the family caregivers. And those include depression, anxiety, delusions, hallucinations, apathy, agitation, and sleep disturbances. Um, and if we can work to really treat those symptoms and have people being able to stay safely and happily in their home and have the caregiver be able to care for them longer, um, that, that would be a, a, you know, a wonderful, wonderful outcome. The Alzheimer's Association, through um, a, a tremendous um, supporter, advocate, and donor named Mikey Hogue, who lives in the Bay Area. Uh, Mikey Hogue started seed funding for um, a translational research program called Part the Cloud. And Part the Cloud really takes um, a, a large, the grants are larger than our typical grants for researchers, and they're typically funding research that is further along um, to becoming uh, an actual treatment. Um, so right now they're looking at things like mitochondria and mitochondria are in each one of your cells, but in, in your brain cells, it's, it's all about the uh, metabolism and energy production. They're also looking at autophagy and that's how you get the garbage out of the brain cells. If, if your tau is causing tangles, how might you get that tau out of the brain cells and maybe get the beta amyloid out from in between the brain cells? And also vascular contra contributions are looking at the brain's blood and circulatory symptoms, neuroinflammation um, as a factor caused by these different things. And there, um, there's a lot of investment in those areas as well. Just to bring it um, a little uh, closer to home locally in Massachusetts, there is a researcher in the Psy Lab at MIT. She received a part of the cloud award and a, um, a company begins with a C, the name is eluding me right now, but they were another recipient of a part of the cloud award looking at vascular dementia and vascular contributions to dementia. Right now, um, the thing that, or some things that get me really excited, uh, the Sprint Mind study was shown, uh, um, presented at the Alzheimer's Association Inter International Conference in 2018. And it was the first study to demonstrate a reduction of new cases of cognitive impairment. And the way that they did it was by keeping the um, top number of your blood pressure, that is the systolic blood pressure, at uh, a lower um, number. So if they were typically Typical treatment for somebody with hypertension is keeping that top number at 140 or below. But if they treated it aggressively, they found that they would reduce the new cases of cognitive impairment in this in this highly at risk group. So that was, you know, huge game changer and um, really not just changing the management of hypertension, but now we've got another way of preventing um, mild cognitive impairment from proceeding into mild Alzheimer's mild Alzheimer's disease. So the thought now is that a combining healthy uh, factors will have the most impact. So you need to combine that physical activity, the lovely woman there in pink doing a tree pose under some nice trees, eating a healthy diet, and cognitive and social stimulation are all important. And lifestyle intervention is being studied with a... Um, a study that's being funded by the Alzheimer's Association. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has invested $5 million in five different US sites, looking at 60 to 79 year olds who are basically couch potatoes. And those 60 to 79 year olds are being divided into self-guided groups and structured lifestyle groups. And they're going to um, address their diet and nutrition their engagement status and their physical activity levels. And um, at the year of the two year um, randomized clinical trial, we'll see what the differences were between the self-guided and structured lifestyle groups and what the results were overall as far as outcomes in um, uh, 
moving forward with a, a progression of dementia. One of the sites, we were really happy to get a site in New England. It's all the way down in Rhode Island at Butler Hospital in Providence. But um, we fought for that and, and we were, we're happy to have, um, have a site in New England. There are other pointer um, types of studies that are that are supported by the National Institutes of Aging. Those include neuroimaging, sleep, microbiome, and neurovascular studies that are all going on as ancillaries. And the um, U.S. pointer, or that is lifestyle intervention, really started um, up here in Finland with the Finnish geriatric um, uh, study, which was also presented at a uh, AAIC in 2018. Um, that has expanded, and now you've got all uh, many, many, many countries joining in these um, lifestyle intervention studies to improve brain health. And the reason we're, that this is so important and will have such an enormous impact is that if we develop a treatment by 2025, just a few years from now, that will delay the onset of Alzheimer's by just five years, that means that 5.7 million people who would be expected to get Alzheimer's by 2050 would not get it. So, and then remembering that 3.5 or $355 billion that we're spending this year, when you think about that trajectory and look at it worldwide on a global standpoint, from a global standpoint, it's just a huge, enormous impact. So I talked about there was a way to do this on your phone. You can download this um, Alzheimer's Association Science Hub app. Just go to wherever you get your apps and um, type Alzheimer's into the search bar and look for the Science Hub app. There are blogs. Um, there, there's a news feed um, and it'll give you the latest updates. So in summary, uh, we're the global leader for Alzheimer's and dementia science, and we're very proud of that. And this is a very exciting new time in research. There are new tools for detection and diagnosis, a growing diversity of, therapy, of therapies under investigation, and new resources and strategies to promote diverse participation. And I'm happy to take questions now. Anita, thank you for the question. How does one go about getting it, uh, a te or getting tested or presumably diagnosed um, is probably what she's after. Yep. Um, the first thing you should do is, is visit your primary care uh, practitioner. That's always the best place to start. Um, and if you need to uh, a referral, they will refer you to um, a specialist. And some of the specialists that they might refer you to would be a neurologist, sometimes a neuropsychologist, um, where you would do um, kind of pen and paper tests uh, very often, sometimes a geriatric psychiatrist, um, just depending on what, what particular symptoms you're having. And But the best place to start is always with your primary care physician. And that's because they can often rule out something um, that that you have something else that is not Alzheimer's disease. So it's um, good to get that ruled out. Great, um, another good question. Have you considered the impact, probably the Alzheimer's Association, no, you personally, Liz, have you considered uh, the impact of both, um, I'm assuming long COVID means like long-term COVID symptoms, post-viral illness, um, CFS on how many will get dementia. These folks already have long lasting or permanent uh, neuroinflammation and autoimmune attacks on the nervous system. Yeah, this was a topic of hot discussion mm -hmm. at the AAIC this year. And in upstate New York, I think, I think he's at the University of Rochester, but I might be wrong. There's a researcher named Thomas Wisniewski, and he is doing a lot of the studies on COVID, that the, the um, what is it, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that causes COVID-19, looking at the neurological sequelae, why people are um, losing their sense of smell so much longer, like never getting it back. In, I'm talking specifically about older adults and people with mild cognitive impairment slash mild dementia. There's so much um, 
uh, information. There, uh, at the AAIC, there was information. Greece and Argentina both had done really interesting studies because remember, it's a, it's a global pandemic and Alzheimer's disease is a global um, uh, disease. Um, so there's a lot of info going on about it. And if you download that Science Hub app, um, it will keep you posted on news that's coming out about that. Uh, so um, Pam, one of the, let's see, Pam Piper, thank you. Um, I often hear about treatments for the early stages of Alzheimer's, including the new drug. Um, what is the, so that goes along with, um, so there's that, what kinds of treatment or research are targeting people further along in the disease? And then she had a second question about sort of what's the difference between, or how do you know that someone's transitioned from the early stage to the later stages? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so, sort of like um, that slide showed where we want to stop that trajectory and keep people to, at the point where they're able to function and participate in their lives and um, be functional with their activities of daily living and um present for their loved ones and their loved ones are present to them. Though that's uh, a lot of the reason that that it really um, looks at targeting the earlier stages or uh, of Alzheimer's disease or that mild cognitive impairment phase before you even get there. Um, as far as the transitions and how do you determine one stage from another, that's really up to your specialists. And they could do it in a variety of ways, um, either with testing like that PET scan testing that we saw, um, as well as the neuropsychological testing that I had, had discussed. But that's really up to your specialists to be able to stage it and, um, and make recommendations based on that. The other thing I would add to what you just said, Liz, is is the functional piece of things. I think, you know, whether it's a prime, whether it's a neurologist or a different type of specialist, they're really going to look at where the person is functionally because a brain scan might not show the full <laughs> uh, breadth, let's just say, or depth of a person's deficits. And so um, a lot of times I feel like when we're um, working with someone at the Alzheimer's Association and we're speaking with a person living with dementia or a family member, we, we look at, you know, how is this person, how, how is their overall functioning and trying to sort out what some of those things are, as well as caregiver, making sure the person is obviously safe, there's supports for the caregiver and so on. So um, I think it's, I, I you know, I, th I think a diagnosis is a puzzle, you know, and Liz has, you know, um, a lot more information than I do about, um, you know, all those medical components. And um, as a licensed social worker, you know, I'm looking at it from that, the psychosocial kind of um, perspective and the resources that we have here in New Hampshire or the lack thereof sometimes, um, <laughs> you know, to support individuals or to help them get um, an accurate and early diagnosis. So good team effort. <laughs> Any other questions about treatments, um, any other burning questions you have about the disease? Now is your, now is the time. I, I guess one thing I might, I might add about the disease uh, or excuse me about the treatment is um, again about the, the new drug called Aduhelm and um, any future therapies that come out. So when you think um, back to um, AIDS, when AIDS was first kind of diagnosed, but, you know, um, as a as a specific um, autoimmune disease that had all these crazy sequelae, um, there it was a long, long time before they even got one drug across the line for it. And now people who are living with AIDS are treated with a cocktail of drugs. And that's also the same for many types of cancer that you might get chemo, you might get radiation, then you might get some, uh, some other um, drugs down the line. So, so it's, um, it's not one, one drug. In other words, it's going to make, uh, make the, the difference. So right now we've got Aduhelm and that is an anti-amyloid. It's going to get rid of the amyloid. Maybe we'll all, we'll have something that gets rid of the tau and then maybe something that addresses the neuroinflammation and something that, you know, 
does other things or do, does something else with the towel or, or the beta amyloid. Um, there, are, there are many, many ways to look at it. Um, but just, um, it was great news that we got a disease modifying treatment, but this is the first. Um, we've got a long way to go and it is certainly not a cure. So I just wanna be really clear about that. Can you tell folks, you might've said this um, in, in one of the slides, Liz, and I might've missed it, but um, letting folks know that there is a follow-up study after the accelerated approval from the FDA. I think a lot of people, um, you know, have mixed feelings about how quickly it went through. So I've heard, you know, from the, from community members. So I, um, uh, the FDA did, did require a follow-up study. Is that, that's correct, right? Yeah. Um, and they do this often. It's, it's not unusual. Yeah. The accelerated approval is, is not unusual. Um, and especially when you have kind of a first in class drug. Um, so what they're saying is, or what the FDA's logic was, if if I may, um, it was that we, we know that this drug gets rid of the beta amyloid. And it looks like it might have, um, and in, in one uh, group of people, it did have an impact on cognition. In the other group of people, it was less clear. So we're going to approve it because we know that it gets rid of the beta amyloid. But we're going to require you, Biogen and ASI, the two companies that, that produce it, to do a phase four clinical trial to look at these um, people who are taking the drug on an ongoing basis so we can really make that distinction about what specifically it's doing. Does that make sense? to people. Um, and Kathy, I know that you're um, one of our um, Aduhelm presenters, right? So if you have anything to add there, go right ahead. Thank you. So, you know, what I wanted to say is um, when we looked at the slide of where we were 10 years ago and investment in research, and we look at where we are now, and we go from, can you, you can repeat the numbers because I don't have them off the top of my head, but they are yeah. 10 yeah. or 11 times basically what yeah. they were. And these are not numbers. These are not wish numbers. These are numbers that the scientific community have identified as saying, this is what we need to, to create disease modification or treatment or prevention. So this comes from the scientific community. The fact that we are getting this kind of research support, and let's be clear here, to me it's really critical, is that the Alzheimer's Association is putting their own dollars, we actually help them raise to things like the walk, but they're also putting all of us as advocates and helping us use our voices to make sure that the federal government hears from us so that those 10 or 11 times investment, they're coming from government funding through the National Institute of Aging and National Institute of Health. And they're because of the grassroots mobilization of folks just like us that the Alzheimer's Association have brought together to say, please let people know that you think this is important. So you are really part of the process to accelerate progress. In other words, all together, we make the difference in supporting the scientists who are so excited about what's what's unfolding. But we need to keep in, a, in the most positive way possible. We need to keep the the pressure and the encouragement on to keep investing in research because that is what's going to be the solution to this overwhelming problem. At the same time, I, I can't. I, I want to just mention because some of you are sitting. And listening to this today are perhaps a caregiver. And so you're thinking, well, I'm hearing about disease progression. I'm hearing about research that will help there. But gosh, I'm wondering, how do I cope? What do I do? And that is one of the things that the Alzheimer's Association has been so key in helping with. And again, not only in providing advice and program support through their and their 24-7 helpline, but again, through advocating with policy, and that's actually what's in my screen here, is saying we need support for caregivers. We need to allocate dollars for to train caregivers, to find respite for caregivers, because they are the ones, just like the scientists are on the front line of discovery, it's caregivers who are on the front line of care every single day, 24-7. And so the <laughs> Alzheimer's Association is helping 
do that. So once again, you know, just saying that they don't, they're not doing this in, the va in a vacuum. They're doing it because people like you and people like me have said this is important. We are being the voice for people who cannot maybe be the voice themselves. So I just thank everybody for using your voice, using your social media, using your, your connection with friends, using letters to the editor, whatever it's going to take to just make sure that your voice and your experience is being heard because you are the experts here and you are the ones that are going to help all of us get this across the line. And I think that's what we're, we all need to do. So thanks. And Kathy, that actually segues into a question someone had about, uh, you know, seeing as there are so many people living with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, where, where are all the caregivers going to come from and how will they be paid? And so something Kathy knows a lot about is um, being an, an unpaid, unpaid, excuse me, caregiver. And we have, you know, tens of thousands of them in New Hampshire, um, as well as, you know, neighboring Vermont. And um, there are I'll, I can't, I don't know the number in Massachusetts off the top of my head, Liz, but there's 120, 130,000 people in mass living with Alzheimer's disease. So there's got to be, you know, several hundred thousand more that are caregivers. But right now, a lot of the caregiving is either through um, family, you know, informal supports, or um, it's expected that families will need to pay for care. Medicare does not pay for ongoing custodial care, which are kind of like those non-skilled needs um, that, that we all need, you know, um, housekeeping, meal prep, medication management, you know, some of the, you know, help, help with chores, things like that, transportation to and from doctor's appointments, all those regular ongoing things that you, that are really crucial um, in between the skilled care, like nursing and OT and PT and speech and things like that. Um, the custodial care is not covered by Medicare. And so um, a lot of people um, think that, you know, ongoing home care uh, will be paid for. Unfortunately, it's not, which is why, uh, you know, we, we do talk with families or we have other education programs about thinking and planning for the future financially, legally, in terms of what care the person's going to want and the family can provide, all of those things are, are really critical um, because caregivers are overburdened. And Kathy, you mentioned, you know, respite care. Um, we already in New Hampshire, and I, I have a feeling it's it's quite the same in Vermont and in Maine as well, uh, up here in Northern uh, New England, you know, um, even before COVID, we, we didn't have enough uh, adult day programs for people to go to. We didn't have, we're having, Northern New England is having an incredibly difficult time, as is the nation in terms of just getting um, enough staff for like a home care agency to send out to provide care for someone who needs it and who is able and willing to pay. Um, so the staffing shortages is, is, a, is a whole separate issue, but um, caregiver burnout is something that we uh, spend a lot of time working with family members on um, and those other informal supports. Um, so it's not going to come from any one place. And, um, you know, we're trying to think creatively about how we can increase respite for caregivers and just support caregivers in their homes um, as they're supporting their loved one. Um, Kathy, I'm curious if you had, um, you know, if, if there was, I'm sure there could be many, but if you had um, maybe one thing that you could have gotten as a support, as a caregiver, what, what would that have looked like? Yeah, so um, I don't know everybody on the call, obviously, but, but I, I, did, I did this, the dementia journey with my husband um, who um, died from younger onset Alzheimer's in 2019. And his, like most people with a dementia of any sorts, whether it's Alzheimer's or FTD or Louis, whatever, it frequently, it's a very, very long journey. And our journey was more than a decade long. So what did it take? It, it took a tremendous amount of time and resources to figure out how to meet my husband's needs. And if I could have had um, if I could have had extra hands to do those things that Melissa was talking about to support me so that I could do some of the other things to maintain our, our home and to main, um, for me to be able to work longer and so forth, it would have made a huge difference if I, if it, whether it was a volunteer or whether I would have been able 
to access um, paid care. So for that reason, it's really the, the hardest part of the journey. If this is not like a, um, a complicated cancer diagnosis or even complicated uh, cardiac situations where you're talking about extremely expensive um, interventions. If these are long-term day-to-day care that is not covered in the same way that those same other things are covered with insurance. So if, if we had a Medicare system, if we had a healthcare system, if we had insurance that would address some of those needs for non-technical support, but custodial needs to support families, this would have made a huge difference to me and to, to my family and not just us, to, to anybody. So again, I'm going to go back to to say that there are some um, there's some policy things in the works right now with our current um, with our current uh, legislation at the federal level, looking at some of those issues of Medicare management and more creative and more um, progressive ways that we are really it's not about pie in the sky. It's not about wishful thinking. It's about rising to meet the challenge that is already there. So we're going to have to find ways not only to find more healthcare workers, we are going to have to find ways to support those families who are doing the burden of this work every single day. So there are things at the policy level that um, I recognize we have to change the way we support caregiving families. And, and Kathy, thanks so much for, for saying that, um, but some of the work that we're doing um, on an advocacy standpoint is things like if a person is has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, that they would qualify immediately for Medicare without um, any kind of a waiting period, which is often critical for people who are diagnosed early, like Kathy's husband and my mom, who was... Um, I think in her, she was in her 50s um, when, when she was diagnosed. So, um, and we're also working with state um, uh, governments looking at what does uh, the Medicaid program, um, how can they offer supports for people with uh, dementia and diagnosis, um, whether it's support for uh, payment for respite, whether it's um, earlier access to benefits, uh, whether it's, you know, paying for different programming that would be helpful to the caregiver. So um, Cecilia, your, your um, point is well taken um, and, and uh, definitely encourage everyone here to advocate, call your uh, local, your local um, that is statewide government as well as your federal uh, people. And um, I know New Hampshire and Vermont, especially New Hampshire, Melissa, I want to say, have um, they know us pretty darn well, <laughs> the, your, your state reps and state senators. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Kathy wouldn't have it any other way. But uh, yes. And we, we yeah, we have a we have a new um, manager of public policy. So she's really getting out there and um, we are pursuing several new pieces of legislation. Um, some of which will be supporting caregivers, some of which will be um, helping uh, to create stronger consequences for people who financially exploit or abuse vulnerable adults, you know, things of that nature. One other question, Liz, that I thought was interesting that um, sort of not in this exact way gets asked a lot, but um, someone was curious why an autopsy would show maybe um, that a person had amyloid, but the person wasn't wasn't ever diagnosed as having dementia. So how how would that how would that happen? Not even just on an like a death certificate or an, an op autopsy report, but how would how would someone have amyloid in the brain and maybe never get diagnosed? That's a good question. Those are the people that that we need so critically. In, um, in research. So these are the people um, who, who would perhaps hold the um, DNA key. To, so here's a person that has this um, toxic buildup of protein in their brain and yet did not progress to a, a point where they had the symptoms of dementia. So that from a, from a clinical or research standpoint, those are the people that they're most interested in. And um, 
what you know again back to paying for different scans or or what is government going to reimburse for um people who volunteer for studies and they have amyloid buildup in their brain but again are asymptomatic are are really on the cutting edge of of what we need to um to unlock in the rest of us, right? What is that neuroprotective element that they have and how can we reproduce that and unlock it in, in other people? Um, so, so yeah, it's great. So it, the, the different brain banks, uh, there's, a, there's a huge one at, at Boston University. That's the biggest one that I know of pretty much in the nation, but the, um, the different brain banks that are looking at people who donate their their brains after death are doing a lot of research into that um, now. So I don't know that I have an actual answer to the question, but it's so fascinating. No, I mean, I think, I think, and I think they were curious about research. So I think it, it definitely sounds like it's an area for research and people wouldn't necessarily know if they had that extra amyloid in the brain um, while they're living, unless maybe they participated uh, in a preventative research study, right? Exactly, exactly. Yes. You know, free PET scans for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Participate in a study <laughs> or an MRI or, you know, whatever it is. So, yep. Um, yep. but yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Cause we do get, we do get asked that question. Oh, and Kathy, go ahead. Did you want to ask? Or, I, I just or... wanted to say I was in the car driving this weekend and there was, I want to say it was an NPR talk just about this very piece of research. And I, I had to, I had to bail, so I couldn't follow it. But it would sure be great to get that um, site and to learn more about it because, you know, for the first time, there's a there's a group of people down in Colombia, South America, who are genetically predisposed. They all get younger onset Alzheimer's. And it was a huge discovery just this last year that one woman who had the same features as all the rest of her kins, kinsmen, she just died of something else, of, of cancer. And when they did an autopsy on her brain, she is one of these, it was the first time we knew, oh my gosh, there are people who have something else going on. So this, is, this could not be more cutting edge. If we, and So we're on to it now and the scientists are working very hard, but I'm just saying if somebody can find that NPR um, talk and, and put it in the link at some point, that would be great. Cool. I'll look for it, Kathy. And I'm, and then see if we because we're at, at time here, but yep. I can see if the Osher Institute would be able to post it with the link to the talk. But thanks for that. And thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, we had a great group. We almost had um, close to 50 people <laughs> there, so at one point. So yeah, we really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, um, <laughs> I did put our, our helpline and my email in there. <laughs> so um I work in New Hampshire. Um, Liz and I, because we're we work for the Massachusetts New Hampshire chapter, um, we're colleagues together. Um, I oversee the programmatic work um, for the most part in New Hampshire, and I'm working out of Manchester, New Hampshire, right now. But if you're from Vermont or you know calling in from somewhere else, then um, you know I can get you to where you need to go anyway. Even if you reach out to me and I'm not the exact person, we can we can get you where you need to go. Anyways, um, if there aren't any other questions, let me check one more time. Um, just a uh, great job, Liz, nice comments. Um, so we thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and with that, we will, we will let you go, we're at time. And if you do have questions, please feel free to call our 24 hour helpline. It's available, available to you at no cost, 20, literally 24 hours a day. And, um, or you can uh, call me at the number I provided or email me. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks all so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Appreciate you. it. Bye. Happy thank Monday. You.